How far can I get this to fly? And can you code your own video game? Let's find out. Welcome to Science at Six. My name is Andrew. Last week, we challenged you to make your own paper aeroplane. The world record for how far a paper aeroplane has flown is 69.14 meters. But how well will my paper aeroplane fly? Let's find out. So, why does our paper aeroplane fly? It's because of its wings. As our aeroplane is moving forward, the wing is hitting the air that is in this room. Now, two things could happen. One, as the wing hits the air, the air gets pushed down. Or two, as the wing hits the air, the wing gets pushed upwards. In fact, both of these things are happening. As our aeroplane moves forward and the wing hits the air, the air gets pushed downwards and the wing gets pushed upwards. This allows our paper aeroplane to fly and it will keep being pushed upwards as long as it is moving forwards and hitting more air. But because it doesn't have an engine, it is eventually going to slow down and stop, and so that's why our paper aeroplane will crash into the ground. But now it's time to find out what you have been doing at home this week. Hello, my name's Mandy, and I'm here to answer a question that's been sent in by five-year-old Toby, who asks, why do volcanoes erupt? Well, that's a great question, Toby. So let's start th by thinking about the ground under our feet. It feels pretty hard, doesn't it? This is called the crust and it's made of rock and it's around 30 kilometers thick. Now, the crust isn't one solid skin round the earth. It's made up of a number of different bits called plates. Underneath the crust is so hot that the rock melts and is called magma. So the plates that form the crust float around on the molten rock and they get pushed and pulled around when the melted rock moves. When two plates move towards each other, one section slides on top of the other and the one underneath is pushed down. Magma, or the melted rock, is squeezed up between the two plates. Pressure builds up and the magma works its way to the surface. At the surface, it erupts to form lava flows and ash deposits, and that grows the volcano. So that over time, as the volcano keeps erupting, it will get bigger and bigger. There aren't any volcanoes in the UK. The largest volcano in Europe is Mount Etna in Sicily. Did you know the name volcano comes from the name of Vulcan, the Roman god of mythology? So keep sending in your questions and we'll do the best we can to answer them for you. Thanks everyone. And remember, if you want your questions or experiments on the show, send them in to openupscience at cambridgesciencecentre.org or any of our social media. Now, from paper to computers, a friend of the centre, Tom, from The Code Zone, is going to show us how you can make your own video game at home. All right, guys, hope you're all doing well. I'm Tom from The Code Zone. Now, normally we'd be at the Science Center programming some robots and flying around some drones, but sadly we can't do that at the moment. So instead, we thought we'd set you guys a challenge which you can do from home for the Science Center's coding theme. Using Scratch, you guys are gonna have a go at making one of the first ever video games, Pong. Now, don't worry if the idea of making a video game is a bit daunting, it's a lot easier than you might think, and I'm here to help you in that process. So once you're done watching this video, click on the link in the description down below and you can have a go at this challenge. Once you clicked on that link, you will come to this page here where you can select the difficulty level you wanna do based on your age and your experience with Scratch. Chuck in an email address and a name, nickname, whatever you want, just means we can send you over a link to your saved work so you can keep working on your project. Make sure you're using a computer or a tablet as mobile screens are a little bit too small to display everything properly. I'm gonna hop on over to a different tab where I have a completed version of the game. Here's one I made earlier. When it loads up, a video of me will appear here telling you how our user interface works and telling you how Scratch works for those who have never used it before. I'm not gonna bore you with that now. Instead, I'm gonna show you Pong. It's a nice, simple game. It's virtual table tennis, essentially. The end of the game is to stop the ball from getting 
past your paddle. There you go, we've got a point straight off the bat, nice and easy. The computer control paddle here starts off very easy at the beginning and gets harder the more points you get. Ball also speeds up as the match goes on as well, so it does get harder throughout the rally. There you go, nice little deflection there. As I said, one of the first ever video games, old school, retro game, but it's still really good fun and it has endured in many ways. One more rally, one more rally. Let's see if we can get this. Let's see if we can get third point. Come on. There we go. There we go. Excellent. What I wanted to show you guys in particular was the controls for the computer paddle. Now, it looks like it should be quite complicated, but it's really quite simple. This is it. All that paddle is doing is checking if the ball is above or below the center of the paddle. And if it's above there, the paddle goes up. And if it's below, the paddle goes down. So it's your job to write the code for that really simple code. And yet you look like you're a computer genius for adding that into your game. So when you finished this video, click on the link in the description, have a go at this challenge. Now back to the studio. Nice, thanks Tom. Pong is the oldest video game, the first one ever made. And you can log on to the code zone by clicking the link in the description below and you can make it yourself. Now, we're using computers a lot nowadays. We use them for games, we use them for videos, we use them for work. But most of us only use the end product. We play the game of Pong. We don't usually build it. But Mia has been talking to Joss Martin, who uses code in his job. All right, Joss, thank you very much for joining us. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Thanks, Mia. So my name's Joss Martin. Uh, I work for MathWorks, the makers of MATLAB and Simulink. I'm an engineering director there, uh, responsible for trying to work out how to do large scale computations on parallel computers and in the cloud. Wow, okay, so what does an average day look like for you then? Yeah, I was worried you'd ask me this. So <laughs> now an average day, there is no such thing as an average day. Um, so the sorts of things that we worry about are how to build models of systems, or at least we provide tools that allow our customers to build models of systems. So the sort of system you'd build it of is a bit of a car, the how the drivetrain works. Or perhaps if you're in the aerospace industry and you're trying to work out how to help a plane fly, perhaps manage its fuel systems, manage the control surfaces, things like that. So what we're worried about is being able to run simulations on very large scale systems that might be hundreds or thousands of computers at the same time. Wow, lots of variation then. <laughs> Amazing. So what is it about your job then that you enjoy or that makes you want to do it? So before joining MathWorks, I was an academic. Um, well, you'll discover I was a physicist. Um, the thing that really excites me is that the MathWorks is all about trying to accelerate the pace of engineering and science. That is basically our mission. That's what we want to do. And as a previously as a scientist and now as a software developer, I really enjoy being part of that process. I really like the technical challenges that being able to try and produce software that does these difficult things entails. But I also like being able to see where it gets used. So in various academic environments, in industry, in fact, even in the latest uh, COVID-19 outbreaks, just making a difference to the world through engineering and science is really, really important. Finally, could you please name someone who inspires you? So I was thinking a little bit about this. You, you, you did give me the question earlier. Um, so I wanted to bring up actually a person that I, uh, I think it's very interesting to consider is Alan Turing. Um, firstly, obviously, he is the father of computer science. So as you start to think about how do we even consider different computing systems and comparing them to each other, you might have heard of something called the Turing machine that he came up with, which was the general idea of a computing system. But actually, way more personally is the fact that he was very involved with breaking the Enigma code in World War II. The reason that's personal to me is that I actually spent some time writing programs to try and break Enigma fairly recently. And so I wrote programs to try and break Enigma 
on large scale parallel computers where, okay, fine, it takes me maybe four weeks to write the program and then I can crack Enigma. But I have computers that are incredibly powerful. Having done this, I know how incredibly hard it is. I have no idea how he even thought about doing this during World War II when he didn't even have a computer. So therefore, I, I, have, a, I have a lot of respect for what he managed to do. Fantastic. All right, thank you so much for joining me, Joss. Thank you very much, Mia. It's been a pleasure. Did you understand what I was saying? No? Well, I was using Morse code to spell out this week's theme, which is code. Code is a way of sending information. We use computer code to send information into computers. We can use a light and Morse code to send information to people when they can see us but can't hear us. And we can also use codes to send secret messages. Keep an eye on our social media or get our Open Up Science magazine to learn more about code this week and get some help in making your own code, which you can send in to us at openupscience at cambridgesciencecentre.org or any of our social media. And we'll have a look at some of them on next week's show. But for now, have a fantastic week, everyone, and I'll see you later. <laughs>